How you doing? I'm Callan and this is Slapped Ham. The following bizarre mysteries are sure to freak you out. So hit that subscribe button and get ready for more scary content. Just like this. Many urban legends tell of a story of a deranged mental patient who escaped an insane asylum to prey on nearby men, women and children. While these stories are often complete fabrications that play on common fears and misconceptions about individuals with psychological problems, in the case of the Cropsey legend, a killer associated with a mental institution who was convicted of murder, it probably didn't turn out how most people would expect. According to the most common iteration of the popular legend which circulated around New York City through the 70s and 80s, Cropsey was an escaped mental patient who hid in the tunnels underneath an old tuberculosis hospital during the day. At night time, he would supposedly prowl the darkness, in search of wayward children and vulnerable targets to prey on. Some iterations of the tale claim that he had a hook for a hand, and the character even made an appearance in The Burning, a 1981 slasher film. Although it's a thrilling tale, no such figure was ever found on Staten Island. Some people even believe that this story was just a clever way to keep kids and teenagers from exploring the many abandoned factories and institutions dotting the landscape of Staten Island at the time. Nonetheless, while the details of the Cropsey legend may have been exaggerated and distorted over the years, the tale does have a strong basis in reality. The story has its roots in a string of disappearances from the early 70s to the late 80s. Throughout this period, children went missing around Staten Island, and although authorities suspected a man named Andre Rand from the start, they simply couldn't find any concrete evidence to detain him. Despite having been convicted of sexually assaulting a girl in the late 1960s, Andre Rand had somehow managed to keep his job as a custodian and orderly at the Willowbrook State School, a mental institution on Staten Island that he'd been working at since the mid-1960s. Although the institution didn't seem to care about its employees' backgrounds, his shady past eventually came to haunt him after the disappearance of a young girl named Alice Pereira on Staten Island in 1972. Aware of his criminal record, local police questioned the man soon after the girl was reported missing. However, despite their suspicions, they didn't have enough evidence to detain him, so they had to let him go. Over the next 15 years, he was thought to be involved with several more disappearances, but he was only charged in one incident, wherein he kidnapped 11 children and brought them across state lines to buy them lunch. Thankfully, nobody was hurt in the incident, but he only served 16 months. Once he was out of prison, the disappearances continued. Finally, in 1987, a girl named Jennifer Schweiger was reported missing, and she had last been seen with Andre Rand. By this time, the Willowbrook State School had recently closed, and its large campus had become a prime location for squatters and vagrants, including the recently unemployed Rand. Suspicious of the man and aware of his whereabouts, the local authorities searched the school, and after more than a month, an officer noticed what appeared to be a shallow grave on the premises. Soon after the grave was discovered, the police dug it up and identified Schweiger's body. Nearby, police found a makeshift camp that had been erected by Rand, all but confirming their suspicions. Following this discovery, Rand was found guilty of first-degree kidnapping, but they didn't have enough evidence to convict him of murder. He was sentenced to 25 consecutive years in prison, and he was set to be released in 2013. However, in 2004, more evidence was uncovered that linked him to the 1981 disappearance of Holly Ann Hughes, a young girl from the Staten Island area. Again, they couldn't convict him of murder, but he got another first degree kidnapping charge and was sentenced to another 25 to life in prison. It looks like he'll be eligible for parole in 2037. So if you live in New York City, then you should be extra careful and pay close attention to the headlines around that time. Have you ever seen a mannequin that looks so lifelike that you could have sworn it was a genuine human body? If you have, then you're not alone. And this may explain why so many stories of corpse mannequins have popped up over the years. 
One fateful day in 1976, a studio was filming an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man at the New Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach, California. A hanging mannequin was obscuring a shot, so one unlucky film technician had to move it so that the crew could continue filming. As he started to get it out of the way, an arm broke off, and it became pretty clear that this wasn't any ordinary mannequin. Within an instant, he noticed human bone and muscle around the broken piece of the mannequin's arm, and the crew quickly realised they were dealing with a corpse. After some investigation, it was found that the corpse belonged to an old criminal named Elmer McCurdy. Having been linked with a series of unsuccessful train robberies and bank heists, he eventually met his end after being shot by police officers in 1911. Due to his lack of friends or family, nobody claimed his body and it was quickly embalmed and put on display by a dubious undertaker. At some point in 1916, some carnival owners posed as McGurdy's brothers to con the undertaker out of McGurdy's body. From then on, the body was used in sideshow attractions by a slew of different owners across the United States, and it eventually found its home at the New Pike Amusement Park. Upon being uncovered by the film crew 65 years after his death, McCurdy was finally buried at a cemetery in Oklahoma. If you've ever been on a road trip, then you've probably dealt with your fair share of questionable motels. Between the drug deals, questionable hygiene, and strange characters that frequent them, there's no wonder that there's so many urban legends that have centered around these dilapidated venues. One of the most common stories describes a family or individual unwittingly spending the night in a room with a corpse under the bed. Still, despite the legends, there were never any verified instances of this happening until a couple booked room 222 at a Memphis hotel in January 2010. Upon entering their room, they immediately noticed a foul odour, and no matter what they did, they couldn't cover it up. Coincidentally, detectives from the Memphis Police Department investigated the motel concerning a missing person case a couple of times over the next few days, but they never checked out the Sargent family's room, and the hotel staff claimed they hadn't noticed anything strange about the room. The missing woman was Sony Millbrook, and she and her family had been staying in room 222 at the motel for several weeks before she had allegedly checked out. Despite having checked out, she was reported missing after she failed to pick up her children from daycare. However, the trail was cold and the police couldn't seem to find a lead. In the meantime, the sergeant couple complained about the room to the motel staff, but they refused to let them stay in a different room. Sick of the smelly room, they stayed at another hotel for some time, but they eventually came back because they couldn't find a better price elsewhere. Upon their return, they spent another day in the room, and it was even smellier than before. Finally, more than five weeks after the sergeant couple had first checked in, a motel worker found a corpse under the bed in room 222. Following this, Lakeith Moody, the woman's boyfriend at the time of her disappearance, was apprehended and sentenced to life in prison for the strangulation of Sony Millbrook. While it's good that the culprit was eventually brought to justice, one has to wonder why it took so long. Why did the hotel staff not report the strange smell to the police? And why did the detectives not check the room in which the missing person had been staying? While some people have conspiracies and wacky theories about both aspects of the case, the most likely answer is plain incompetence. Thus, whether you're managing a hotel or running an investigation, it's always important to remember to follow your nose and leave no stone or bed unturned. In 1981, rumours started to spread about an arcade game like no other. They called it Polybius and said that it had psychoactive effects like some kind of hallucinogenic drug. While many have said that games have addictive properties, much like a drug, people claim that Polybius gave users a strong psychological urge to keep playing the game. While many variations of this legend exist, most versions of the story claim that the Polybius arcade cabinets mysteriously appeared in various spots throughout Portland, Oregon, and caused a slew of deaths and hospital visits immediately after their installation. 
Moreover, their appearances allegedly coincided with encounters with government agents and mysterious men in black. Reportedly, users would develop amnesia, hallucinations, insomnia, and other serious symptoms after playing the game. According to the most common version of the tale, all game cabinets disappeared within a month of installation, making the story conveniently difficult to verify for skeptics and journalists at the time. No genuine Polybius arcade cabinets have ever been found, and it's widely considered to be a simple urban legend. Nonetheless, several games have caused physical and psychological symptoms in various individuals throughout the history of gaming. Around the inception of the Polybius rumour, an Oregonian named Michael Lopez had to call emergency services after playing the game Tempest on an otherwise ordinary day. He claimed to have experienced a severe migraine and had vision issues after playing the game for some time. According to a newspaper in the area, the bright lights and flashing effects were very disorienting. Thus, the game could have plausibly caused migraines or affected individuals with sensitivities to flashing lights. Games, hardware and visual media were not as well regulated back then, and video game studios often hired very small and inexperienced teams because the medium was still rather new at the time. Consequently, it's no big surprise that bad or harmful video games were occasionally released to the public. Tempest is just one of many games throughout history that have caused medical problems for players. For example, in 1982, 18-year-old Peter Bukowski achieved a high score in the game Berserk, and subsequently experienced a cardiac event that led to his death. While some sources claim that he was obese or suffered from heart disease, according to other reports, he was a healthy young man with no known problems. Whatever the case may be, his death serves as a cautionary tale, to temper your excitement and not get too carried away. Otherwise, you could find yourself in an ambulance. The aforementioned deaths and other similar events in the early 1980s likely had some influence on the Polybius myth. Moreover, video games were relatively new at the time, so people would ascribe strange and magical properties to arcade cabinets, consoles, cartridges and other related media. Of course, most people now understand that video games are just complex compilations of binary code that don't contain any supernatural properties, but it's still a good idea to limit your screen time and not get too excited when you do well in a game. Before we get on to our last story, remember to caress that subscribe button and tickle that little bell icon there and turn on all channel notifications. That way you'll be in the loop every time we drop our scary and mysterious videos. Also, remember to click that like button. Oh yeah. If you've ever worked in a high-rise office building, you've probably heard the urban legend of a guy pretending to test the strength and sturdiness of the windows and accidentally plunging to his death. Gary Hoy, a securities law specialist at a company in Toronto, plunged from the 24th floor of the TD Bank Centre in Toronto after jumping through a window in an insane stunt that had no real purpose. People have whispered about unbreakable windows in skyscrapers across the globe for as long as skyscrapers have existed, but nobody ever dared test the urban legend until July 9, 1983. For some reason, on that day, Gary really wanted to liven up the atmosphere for a group of new interns while conducting a routine tour. Upon reaching a conference room, the man claimed that the office windows in the office were impossible to break, and to his credit, he wasn't exactly wrong. As he reportedly done many times before, Gary Hoy took position and slammed himself against the window, but that would be the last thing he would ever do. The window was quite durable, it didn't break after the 160 pound man rammed into it. However, the window did manage to pop out of its frame. Unable to stop his forward momentum, Gary Hoy flew out the window with the window pane and died upon impacting the ground just a couple of seconds later. While his death was tragic, thankfully nobody else was injured in this event. The man's recklessness could have easily killed or injured several passers-by if they would have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. By going out in such a way, Gary Hoy will forever be immortalised in television shows and online articles as someone who suffered one of the most avoidable deaths in history.
Now, if you want some more unsolved mysteries, and check out that link on the top there. Otherwise, this massive paranormal playlist here will freak you out. Now, remember to leave us a comment down below. We love getting your feedback and pulverize that thumbs up button. And that's it for me. I'll see you all next time. <gasps>